All right, first, second, third John for beginners. Lesson number three, title of this lesson, Abiding in Love. We're going to be covering first John chapter 2, 28 to chapter 3, 24. Uh, as you know, as we have uh, studied, John here is uh, writing to Christians who have been influenced by false teachings concerning the identity of Christ and the manner in which they are saved. These, uh, we call them Gnostic teachers. These Gnostic teachers are proposing that Jesus was only a spirit and in order to be truly saved, uh, they must adhere to special secret knowledge involving restrictions of foods and normal relationships and marriage and so on and so forth. So these, these Gnostic teachers come along and they're saying, well, you, know, you, you, you received the gospel you know, from the apostles, but that's not good enough. There's more, there, there, there's this secret knowledge, there's this better knowledge that we have that will uh, guarantee uh, your uh, salvation. So basically that was, that, that's what was taking place. So John refutes these false ideas in, um, in two ways. First of all, he describes his eyewitness experience of Jesus to demonstrate that Jesus was fully God and fully man at one time because as I mentioned, they were questioning uh, the uh, nature of Jesus' uh, person. In other words, he, he wasn't really a human, he was really just the spirit, he, was, uh, he only appeared as a human, uh, he only had the spirit of God for a time. In other words, they were questioning his fully divine and fully human uh, 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 nature, the, 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 the combination of those two in one uh, nature. So John responds by saying, hey, you, you guys haven't seen him. I've seen him. I've lived with him. You know, he's, I've, I've touched him. I've heard him speak. I've watched him. So he offers that uh, as a, uh, one way to refute their false ideas, his own personal experience. And then he explains three ways that a person can be certain of their salvation without reference to or need of any special knowledge from these other teachers. You know, his, his idea is, I'll, I'll show you how you can be sure that you're saved without reference to any of this special knowledge, this secret knowledge that's being, you know, uh, being sold to you. The last week uh, we examined John's description of the real Jesus and the first of the ways that we can be certain of our salvation. John said that we can be certain by observing our own behavior. You want to be sure that you're saved? Observe your own behavior, for starters. And he called the behavior walking in the light. John taught that our behavior in the areas of personal conduct, where we are obeying Jesus' commands, in the area of social relationships, where we are loving our brothers and sisters, in the area of our separation from the world. In other words, our focus on heavenly things rather than our focus on earthly things. And then our adherence to truth. In other words, what are we teaching? What are we sharing as far as the truth is concerned about Jesus Christ? So these four areas, observe yourself in personal conduct, social relationships, separation from the world, and adherence to truth. And if you observe your conduct, it will reflect back to you what kind of person you are. So it was a, a, a self-test, if you wish, to see if you're walking in the light. And walking in the light, uh, a term that uh, John uses uh, to mean several things. Walking in the light can mean you're a saved person can mean that you know what the truth is and you're living according to the truth. But he uses this one term to kind of encompass all of these ideas together. So if you were walking in the light in these various ways, then it was proof of your salvation. So in our lesson today, we're going to look at another way that we can be certain that we are saved, another way that John you know, teaches. And that is knowing the good from the bad. That's another way that we know we are these people who are walking in the light. 
Now before we do this, uh, we need to review a passage which we neglected last week. I said that the first way to assume certainty in salvation was by walking in the light. And John explains the four ways that one behaves to prove that he is walking in the light. Now at the end of chapter two, John makes a, a kind of a parenthetical statement about how to determine those who truly belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ. How to do that? Remember, they were being seduced by false teachers and they were having trouble telling the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. That, that was the problem. Okay? So he's going to give them some information on how, how do you tell the difference between the good and, and the bad. So in chapter 2, 28 to chapter 3, verse 10, he provides them with a foolproof method of discerning the good from the bad. So let's read chapter 2, verse 28 and 9. He says, now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. So he encourages them to be faithful to Jesus so that when Jesus returns, they will not be afraid or ashamed of their unfaithfulness or sinfulness. You know, someone who's faithful to the end has nothing to fear, actually uh, looks forward to the return uh, of Christ. And then he makes a, a, a key statement that he's going to use in the next 10 verses, explaining everybody who does, not, who, everybody who does what Jesus does belongs to Jesus. Kind of self-evident, isn't it? In other words, the people who do what Jesus would have done, these are the good guys, he's saying. These are the ones you listen to. These are the ones you follow. These are the ones you're supposed to learn from. So in chapter three, verse one, he continues. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. So John goes on to comment on how wonderful God is to make us His children. This is just another way of saying He saved us. Remember I've mentioned before, there are very you know, many different ways to describe a person's salvation. And this is one of them, that God made us His children. Now he says, because God has made us His children, we're different from people in the world. Have you ever, have you, have you ever tried to, you, know, you get an opportunity, somebody asks you a question about religion, who themselves, they're not people of faith or anything like that, but you get an opening you know, to, to share your faith and to talk. And you're talking to them and you're sharing your faith and you're talking about Jesus and you're talking about you know, there is a God and uh, you know, God loves us, He wants us to be saved. And you're, you're doing all of that and it's like you're throwing a tennis ball against the wall and it just keeps coming back to you. And in your own mind, it's so clear, it's crystal clear, how could anybody miss it? And yet your words just, boom, they, fall, they hit the wall and they just fall to the ground. It's as if you're, it's, you're talking over here and they're over here. You know, you're, you're, you're talking over here and they're way over here. Well, this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. You're the, you're the, you're the person who's in the world, but not of the world. And because you're in the world and not of the world, many times people of the world don't get you. They see your faith as something weird. They see it as a weakness. The best they can do sometimes is, well, that's okay for you, but I don't want any of that. And you're saying to yourself, how could someone not want to be with God? And John is explaining it right here. He says, this is the reason the world does not know us. They don't get it. Not everybody doesn't get it, obviously, because sometimes we do share our faith and people do respond and they, they want to know more. But that's not every time, is it? It's not even the majority of the times.
So he's saying we're so different in our conduct that we are misunderstood and sometimes persecuted in the same way Jesus was persecuted. So he keeps going in verse two. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. So he reminds them that even though there has been a change in them compared to their former lives, there will be another change in us when Jesus returns. That's the thing we're looking forward to. Our present condition is painful, to say the least, because your eyes are open, our eyes are open, and we see ourselves for who we are, sinners. Never quite achieving the perfection that we see. There's always a spoiler, there's always a fly in the ointment. No matter how pure the motives we want, ugh, it's never quite. <laughs> That's painful. That's painful. Psychic, spiritual pain. And here he's saying one day that, that pain's not going to be there anymore. Because what you see, what, that perfection that you see, you will have it. Because what you see in Christ will also be in you. That's what we look forward to. We don't know exactly how we will be changed. You know, the metaphysics of it, whatever. You know, how, how do you become a totally spiritual being with consciousness? You know, I mean, we can talk about these ideas, but we don't fully grasp it yet. So we don't know exactly how will we be changed in order to exist in heaven. All we know is that we will be like Christ, how He is at His appearing. You know, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says. All the stuff that happens at the end of the world, and different people teach, well, this is going to happen, then a thousand years is going to happen, then 50 years is going to happen, then 100 years is going to happen, no. All the stuff the Bible talks about that's happened at the end of the world, like that. All of it, like that. You're here, you're changed, forever. The faithful who are alive at His coming will know Him and see Him when He returns. And there will be no mistake. You won't miss it by accident. If you're afraid, oh boy, I don't want to miss Jesus when He comes, don't worry about that. <laughs> he continues and says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. So you know, all this business of oh, what am I going to do with my life and who am I and you know, what, what's, my, what's my work here? What's my thing here? What should I do here? Well, it's right there, right in this, right in this verse. This is your thing. This is what you're going to do. Everyone who has this hope, what hope? That I'll be like Jesus when He comes, that I'll be faithful when He comes. Everybody who has that hope, what does he do? He purifies himself. What's my job? What's my life about? My life is about purifying my life. My life is about straining out every dirty thing that I come across, that I recognize. That's what my life is about. In preparation for the day that I will be Transform, yeah, I got to work, I have the job, I got to mow my lawn, all that rain, you know, sure, I got to do all of that stuff. I actually enjoy doing that stuff. But that's not what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is I am purifying my life. That's my spiritual work. Not in order to be saved, in order to be ready, in order to begin tasting the fruit of eternal life that is coming. So if this is so, then we are to be ready and act properly. In other words, purifying ourselves just as Jesus did. Our hope is that Jesus will return and take us to heaven. Our lives and our actions are based squarely on this event and this promise. Now, John, once he has established how Christians are to act and why, he describes the very opposite conduct and what that means. So let's uh, keep going this time to uh, Verse four, he says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. 
you know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Now the thing about this passage that you need to be careful of is the word practices. That, that's the operation word in this passage here. And if you skip that, if you don't realize that, you, you could be hurting yourself. The point is that those who practice, meaning it is a habit, it's a way of life, it's a routine, those who practice a sinful lifestyle are not from God, no matter what they say. Practice, not perfection, practice. Now here in this passage, John, contextually, he may now be referring to that group of Gnostic teachers who advocated a hedonistic or a libertine lifestyle as a way of freeing the spirit from the body. Remember their basic teaching was the spirit wants to escape the body. The, the, the spirit is pure goodness, the flesh is pure evil. We had to separate these. One way of doing it was uh, through asceticism, you know, harsh treatment of the body and so on and so forth. The other way was uh, complete abandonment. And so in this passage, he may be alluding to these false teachers who are promoting this idea of you know, immoral living as a, as a way of, of spiritual development. As I said, some of the teachers said that since there is no connection between the soul and the body, the body could do what it wanted without affecting the soul. I don't know about you, but that, that sounds like a pretty fun religion to me. Anything you do in your body does not affect your spiritual life. Really? Wow. I can cheat, I can steal, I can you know, be sexually impure, I can be mean and selfish and self you know, I can do all these things. It doesn't affect my soul. I like that. You know, my sinful flesh will go for that. I, you know, sign me up for that religion. So he's kind of you know, pointing to this idea and these false teachers you know, these false teachers' uh, teachings. So this was a pretty attractive doctrine for those who had a weakness for worldly behavior. So John is telling them that Jesus died to take sinfulness away. Anyone who advocates or practices sin, that's what he's talking about here, is not following the one who died for sin. How can you practice sin openly and call yourself a Christian and follow Jesus who died for sin. I mean, the two don't work together. So in verse seven, he says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So in these final verses in this section, John goes one step further by saying that not only are those who practice sin not of God, their behavior shows who they really follow, and that is, of course, the devil. The idea that a son of God doesn't sin means that a Christian does not practice or advocate sin. He tries, she tries, with various degrees of success to practice righteousness. That's what I'm trying to do. Christians are trying to practice righteousness to you know, differing degrees of success, depending on maturity and understanding and so on and so forth. So now that John has explained how to spot the bad group, you know, watch their conduct, observe what they say, what they teach, he gives another way that they can be certain of their salvation, and that is abiding in love. Now John's already mentioned this in the, in the discussion on walking in the light, but in the next section he amplifies and explores the true meaning of Christian love. So let's keep reading verse 11. He says, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, 
And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. you know, before he said they don't, the world doesn't understand you, which is true. Now he says the world hates you. So uh, you know, the world doesn't understand you when you're trying to share your faith. The world hates you when they see you acting righteously before God. So John reiterates the bottom line message of his gospel, which is love. And he refers to Cain and Abel because this is the first example of the command to love being violated. Lots of murders in the, in the Old Testament, but this is the first time that the command to love one another was broken. He also emphasizes the central theme of Christian doctrine to show how off-center the teaching of the Gnostics were. And he mentions the fact that the reason for Cain's murderous rage was his jealousy over his brother's good deeds, which shone brightly alongside his own evil deeds and evil conduct. So John says that this is also the reason behind the world's hatred of Christianity. Their goodness demonstrated the evilness of the world. There's a contrast. You know, we don't like somebody showing us up. Even as Christians, you know, if, if a brother or sister really does the right thing in comparison to what we're doing, even that makes us kind of you know, a little angry, a little jealous, a little resentful. Who does he think he is? You know, wow, she thinks she's perfect. You know? Even we as believers have that attitude when a brother or sister really shines forth in their love and their kindness, their generosity in comparison to what we're doing. Maybe we're just piddling along, you know what I'm saying? Pretty uh, lukewarm as a Christian and all of a sudden there's this great show of love and generosity and forgiveness we see in another person and, and it kind of makes what we're doing look kind of dark. So you can imagine if someone is not even in Christ, how they feel about you know, those who are doing what is right and good. Verse 14, he says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life uh, abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So John emphasizes the idea that you can't claim to be a disciple of Jesus without loving as Jesus loved. Not loving to the degree that Jesus did. I don't know about you know, laying down my life and undergoing torture for someone else. But loving as he did. He loved his enemies and so on and so forth. You know. His extreme example, of course, is Jesus himself dying to save us. In like manner, we should be willing to love, not in word only, but in deed, our brethren. And he says our brethren. Yes, we owe uh, our love to the poor in the world to try to relieve the suffering as we can, of course. But John is very specific about loving the brethren, loving those who believe in Christ as a priority, as a way of demonstrating the strength of our faith. He repeats the idea that if you don't love or help your brethren, you don't belong to God, regardless of what you say, because you don't reflect His basic character. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before Him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. A wonderful benefit and, and defining characteristic of those who love their brethren is the fact that they have confidence in their salvation. They're not walking around feeling guilty all the time. 
You know, I've mentioned that before. You know, Satan may not be able to tempt us to go rob a bank, you know, or kill somebody, you know, the big, the big sins. You know, the, he may not be able to tempt us to do something like that. But he can sure take away any joy that we have in our faith. You know, so that we can't enjoy what God has legitimately given to us to enjoy. He just sucks that dry out of our life. And John, I think, is referring to this. You, you don't have to have a guilty conscience. You don't have to wonder about, am I saved or am I not saved? You know? If you're acting in love towards your brethren, it fills you with the love of God. So he repeats the idea that if you don't love and help your brethren, you don't belong to God because you don't reflect his basic character. And as I read here in um, 19 to 22, um, a benefit defining characteristic of those who love their brethren is that they have, among other things, confidence in their salvation, a clear conscience, and a powerful prayer life because the prayers of the righteous are heard and answered. You know, the best way to dissipate guilt and fear is obeying the Lord and loving your brethren. I mean, I know intellectually, you know, we, uh, intellectually we know in our minds, you know, oh yeah, wait a minute, in November 1977, I confessed that I believed in Jesus and so and so buried me in the waters of baptism and my sins were forgiven. I remember that night. It was cold. The heater wasn't on in the baptistry. It was Montreal. <laughs> it's cold in Montreal in November. The water is cold. I still remember that. Sometimes intellectually we remember the, the process of our salvation. We get it. But many times the attack is not against our intellect. It's against our heart. You know, the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. Day and night he accuses us before God of this and that and this sin and this old sin and that and this imperfection and this failing. It never stops, it always goes on and on and on. And this is what he's talking about here. How to, how, to, how to get rid of that. That quote negative self-talk, I call it devil talk in your brain. In verse 23, he says, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. They've been seduced into thinking that extreme denial of the flesh or extreme worldliness will somehow elevate them to some state of spiritual awareness or freedom that they have not reached yet. And John says that neither these extremes will produce this effect. In the end, a quiet heart, peace in the face of death, confidence before God, and true spirituality are the result of two basic things. Number one, faith in Jesus as the divine savior. You want to know your, if you're still saved 30 years after your baptism? Ask yourself the question, do I still believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God? Yes or no? And am I still depending on His cross to make restitution for every single sin that I have and will commit? And if the answer to those two things is yes, then it doesn't matter how your heart feels, shaky, nervous. God is the one that protects our salvation, not us. I'm not saved based on the degree of confidence I have in my own salvation. I'm saved because God saves me. <laughs> He's the one that has the power to save me. And I entrust that to Him, not to myself. That's, a, that's, that's terrible. I don't depend on me for anything like that. I depend on him for that. And then the sincere love of the brethren who share your faith. 
These two things will identify us as the ones who belong to God and those who possess His Spirit. So, our lesson today has uh, included a, a, a kind of a transitional section where John qualifies who are the good and who are the bad. Those who obey Christ, they're the truly good. And those who disobey Christ by teaching another gospel or by living you know, not according to his precepts, those are, the, those are the bad guys. Should be obvious. Note that it's not their politics or their personality or their position or what they say that determines this. It's a, it's a decision based on one's obedience to Christ. You know, there are lots of popular, likable people who disobey Jesus. Don't be fooled, John says. Those who act like the Lord, those are the good guys. Those are the good guys. And then John gives another way that a person can be certain that they are saved. If they love like Jesus loved. If they love the ones that Jesus loved. Who do you love? Do you love the people in the world? Or do you love the people in the kingdom? These people, he says, belong to God and they are the ones uh, who are saved. All right, so our next lesson in John be our last one in his first epistle. We said you know, this covers first, second, third John. And um, uh, we're going to look at the final way that he says we can assure ourselves of our place uh, with, uh, with God. One more section in that and then we'll continue 2nd John, 3rd John. We'll do those uh, letters. Again, little reading assignment if you wish to read ahead 1st John 4 verse 1 to, uh, to chapter 5 verse 21 and we'll tackle that next week. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it.